A level one trauma is coming into your emergency department. The EMS is relaying that the patient is in shock. How do you diagnose and recognize it? And how do you start management? This is what we're gonna talk about today at Citizen Surgeon. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon, and I'm here to scale surgical education, get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course, to help you crush your exams. Today, we're talking about shock in trauma. This is a really important subject when it comes to trauma. It's one of the first ones in the textbook. You gotta know how to recognize it, to diagnose it, and then start management and treatment. I'm gonna divide this in two different parts. The first part, what we're gonna cover today, is diagnosis, recognition, and of course, physiology in shock. The second is we're gonna talk about the management and treatment of shock in trauma, and we're gonna be referencing the ATLS handbook. I'm also gonna be referencing the trauma textbook by Maddox and his partners. Fantastic reference, definitely check that one out. So let's get into it. What is shock? The definition of shock is the inability of the circulatory system to provide adequate organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation. Remember, blood is basically a vehicle for oxygen and you gotta get that oxygen to the tissues. When we think about shock, the most common cause in trauma is hemorrhagic shock, but there are other causes. Let's take that patient that has a blunt chest injury. They could have blunt cardiac injury and cardiogenic shock. Let's take that patient who has a gunshot to the right chest or a stab wound to the right chest or the diaphragmatic region. They may have a tension pneumothorax. That's gonna be obstructive shock. A gunshot or a stab wound to the chest might also give you a cardiac tamponade if you have an atrial or ventricular injury. That's also an example of obstructive shock. And then you have neurogenic shock. So perhaps somebody dove into a pool, they just sustained a cervical spine injury with a cord injury up around C3, C4. They may present with neurogenic shock. That's gonna require a different set of treatment and management guidelines. So these are really the four different types of shock. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on hemorrhagic shock because that's the most common shock you're gonna see in a trauma patient. Before we talk about how to diagnose, recognize it, we gotta understand some physiology and how this applies to the patient that's in shock. So I got a heart right here. Why do I have a heart? Because we wanna know everything about cardiac output. So what makes up cardiac output? So you have preload, we're gonna talk about that. You have contractility and you have afterload. So these three things come together to produce cardiac output. Now, how do we define cardiac output clinically? So cardiac output is defined by the stroke volume times the heart rate. So anything that modulates or changes or affects these two things, your stroke volume or your heart rate is gonna affect your cardiac output. And so the first concept that I wanna look at getting at this preload, contractility, and afterload is the preload. So what is the preload? All right, if you are a junior resident, maybe a medical student, you are gonna have like these reverberations back to physiology, and you're gonna remember what? The Frank Starling curve. So on the y-axis of our Frank Starling curve, we're gonna have stroke volume. On our x-axis, we're gonna have left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Now, this can be represented as left ventricular end diastolic volume, and you could calculate that if you did have an echocardiogram. So if we draw the Frank Starling curve in the relationship between strike volume to left ventricular end diastolic pressure, left ventricular end diastolic volume, we see this nice curve, okay? Now, this can be shifted to the left or shifted to the right in circumstances, but you can see as the heart has more volume, you're gonna have more stroke volume. As there's more pressure in the left ventricle by filling, you're gonna have more ejection. So you can see that this starts to flatten out after certain high volumes are reached. You can also see that this drops off precipitously when volumes are low. So what are the things we have to think about in left ventricular end diastolic pressure or end diastolic volume? 
Okay, so let's take a normal heart, okay? And so what are the things that we have to think about? Number one is the venous capacitance, okay? The amount of blood that can be stored in the venous system. Second is what is the volume of blood in the venous system? And third is what is the pressure gradient between the right atrium, which is basically the reservoir that the venous system returns to, and the mean venous pressure. So if we go back to that level one trauma that's in shock, perhaps that's a seven-year-old boy who was hit crossing the street and now has a distended abdomen and severe solid organ injury, he's bleeding into his belly. We know that 70% of blood is stored in the venous system. Now when we start bleeding, okay, all of these different mechanisms start to take place and you get this circle and we talked about this in the very first video that I did or the metabolic response to injury. So in there we talked about pain, we talked about hypovolemia and we talked about circulating stuff. So when you have pain and shock, cortisol is released, you start to get the autonomic nervous system involved, epinephrine, norepinephrine, they're going to cause a squeeze of that peripheral vascular system and the venous system to, tar to try to get blood back to the heart, okay? You're gonna have different hormones like antidiuretic hormone that are gonna tell the kidneys to reabsorb water. But in the acute state, these hormones, those baroreceptors that are causing an increase in the heart rate and a squeezing of the venous system and the peripheral vascular system, peripheral arterial system, those compensatory mechanisms are limited. They're only gonna last for so long. Now, because those systems are limited, if we jump over to the treatment management, one thing that I wanna get in your mind is the Stop the Bleed campaign, okay? So Stop the Bleed is the first thing that you need to do in hemorrhagic shock because you can replace volume, you can start to replace blood, but the real answer is to stop the bleeding, okay? So if somebody's exsanguinating, perhaps like in this cartoon from a upper extremity laceration, get a tourniquet or some pressure on there, stop the bleed, reverse the shock. So now I wanna take you through how do we recognize shock? We have this patient, it's being wheeled in, level one trauma, how do we start? Well, we always start with airway, breathing, circulation. In that very first trauma video I did, I'll put a link to it up here, we talked about how to set up the trauma bay, we talked about how to do your trauma timeout, we talked about airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, how to get through the trauma exam. So make sure that you review that. So we do airway, breathing. We want to make sure it's a clear airway. We want to make sure that we're oxygenating, that we have good breath sounds. If we haven't, we need to stop and manage those two things. But eventually we get to circulation. Circulation is really important in the recognition of shock. So what are the things that come in when we're looking and evaluating circulation. So to evaluate circulation, we're gonna be looking at vital signs. So the heart rate, the blood pressure, we're also gonna be looking at things like the skin. Is it nice, pink, and well perfused, or is it pale or even cyanotic? What is the pulse? So not just the heart rate, but what is the character of the pulse? Okay, can you not feel a radial pulse? Can you not feel a femoral pulse or a carotid pulse? Those are gonna give you some indications of what that systemic blood pressure might be. Going back to the skin, is it cool to touch? And then for the breathing, is this shallow, rapid respirations? Are they already in a state of metabolic acidosis from their shock that they are trying to compensate with a, or that respiratory alkalosis, breathing off that CO2? And while all these signs of circulation are incredibly important to evaluate, the two to me that are the most important are the skin and the heart rate, okay? If the skin is pale, blue, almost gray sometimes in near fatal shock, and if the heart rate is elevated, I am gonna be really worried. That's even before I'm able to feel that pulse, okay? So what are the typical heart rates at different ages? All right, so in an infant, tachycardia over 160, okay? In a preschooler, tachycardia is over 140, 
in a child, an old, little bit older child, tachycardia is going to be over 120. And then in an adult or an adolescent, tachycardia is going to be over 100. Okay, so these are the different heart rates where I'm going to be different heart rate thresholds where I'm going to have a significant amount of worry if a patient's coming in as a trauma and they might be in hypovolemic shock. Now, can you think of another measurement from the vital signs that can be an early indicator in a patient for a hypovolemic shock? Now, notice that I haven't talked a lot about systemic blood pressure. The reason is because patients can lose up to 30% of their blood volume and not have a decrease or a significant decrease in their mean arterial pressure, right? So we have to look at other things. Those other things are skin, pulse rate, pulse character, those type of things, okay, rapid shallow breathing. But the pulse pressure, the difference between the systemic and the diastolic pressures is important when it comes to shock. And in fact, when you have that injury and hypovolemia and cortisol, the autonomic nervous system, epinephrine, norepinephrine causing that squeeze and getting all the blood into the heart from the venous capacitance of the venous system, that squeeze is gonna raise mean venous pressure. When you get a raise in mean venous pressure, that's gonna increase the diastolic pressure and drop your pulse pressure, okay? So if you see a narrowed pulse pressure, that is an early indicator that somebody's in hypovolemic shock. Now, if we get into the differential diagnosis, so we've recognized that somebody's in shock, we gotta decide, well, what type of shock are they in? Let's group this into hemorrhagic shock or non-hemorrhagic shock. So let's talk about the non-hemorrhagic shocks first. So like we talked about, we can have cardiogenic shock from perhaps a blunt chest injury. We can have a cardiac tamponade or obstructive shock. We can have a tension pneumothorax, neurogenic shock. We can also have septic shock, perhaps in that patient that was in a, a traumatic accident and now is presenting delayed. Perhaps they have some infection that's causing them to be in septic shock or they were just in trauma, but they have a, something else going on. But because the vast majority of patients are in hemorrhagic shock, let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so if we look at the adult human body, the blood volume is about 7% of the body weight, or five liters. That's different in children. So in children, they have a blood volume of about 80 milliliters per kilogram. Okay, so in the tiniest babies that I operate on, perhaps a one kilo baby, that's only 80 milliliters or about a third of a can of Coke or a can of any soda, okay? So the blood volume is really small, okay? Obviously much larger in an adult. Now when we look at patients with obesity or people with obesity, the blood volume is determined on the ideal body weight. And I'll put a link to the formula for calculating ideal body weight in the description as well. But about 7% of the ideal body weight is the blood volume. Now in shock, we can classify into four different stages or four different grades of shock. And it really has to do with how much blood volume you've lost, okay? So in stage one shock, let's take a 23 year old male who was in an auto pedestrian accident and comes in with uh, the EMS telling you that they're worried that the patient's in shock. So in stage one shock, that's less than 15% loss in blood volume. What are the things that we're gonna see? Not a whole lot, okay? So when somebody's lost up to 15% of their blood volume, okay? So if you have five liters, 15% is gonna be 750 cc's. So that's quite a bit of blood. Almost no physiologic changes happen, okay? So heart rate may or may not be elevated. Blood pressure is gonna be pretty normal. Pulse pressure is gonna be normal. Respiratory rate is gonna be usually be normal. Urine output will be normal. The GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale is normal. And if we get a metabolic profile, the base deficit is gonna be normal as well. All right, well, what happens in stage two? Now we jump up up to 30% loss in blood volume. So think about that. So five liters, 30% of that is gonna be one and a half liters of blood. So when you've lost one and a half liters of blood, things start to happen, okay? This is that patient that would now be tachycardic. So a 20 year old, they come in, heart rate over 100. 
This is also gonna be that patient that has a narrow pulse pressure, okay? So up to 30% blood loss, now you're gonna see an increase in that diastolic pressure because that venous system is squeezing in response to all these circulating hormones. Up to 30% blood loss, you can still have normal blood pressure, you can have normal respiratory rate, you can have a normal GCS, but let's push it now, stage three shock. So what's stage three shock? So this is now 31 to 40%. Now the patient's gonna be showing some signs of being very sick. Okay, so tachycardia, that tachycardia is gonna be climbing. Okay, it's gonna get high. The pulse pressure is gonna be narrowed. The systemic blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure is gonna be decreased now. The respiratory rate is gonna be up. Now we're gonna probably have lack of organ perfusion. We're gonna be developing that metabolic acidosis. The respiratory system is gonna be trying to compensate with shallow, rapid breathing, okay? We may have decreased level of consciousness, so now our GCS is gonna start falling, and we're gonna find that our base deficit is increasing because we have that metabolic acidosis. And here you might see this uh, base deficit between six and 10. So how about stage four shock? So this is near fatal shock, okay? Very high mortality. This is now you've lost over two liters of blood, okay? Almost half your blood volume. You're gonna see significant tachycardia, a very narrowed pulse pressure, if a blood pressure at all. Sometimes these patients will come in and you can't feel a, a, a radial pulse or a femoral pulse, maybe just a faint carotid pulse, okay? They're gonna have very shallow, rapid breathing, a significantly depressed GCS, most likely less than eight, will need to be immediately intubated if they don't already have an airway. They'll have a massively increased base deficit and they're gonna have no urine output. And these patients will usually need a massive transfusion protocol to get blood going. And we're gonna talk about that in the next video on treatment and management of shock and trauma. So notice that I haven't really talked about labs at all maybe just the base deficit, okay? But I haven't mentioned hemoglobin and hematocrit at all. Why is that? Well, in the acutely bleeding trauma patient, if I were to take a liter of blood out of you, what's your hemoglobin or hematocrit gonna be? All right, it's gonna be normal. It might be 12 to 14, why is that? Well, I've taken a liter of blood out of you, you still have four liters of blood in there, and now you haven't compensated. You haven't adjusted yet, okay? Your body's not conserving the water and getting that blood volume increased, which is diluting out that hemoglobin hematocrit. That's where you're gonna see the fall. Okay, so remember, hemoglobin hematocrit, they are concentration and values. And if I take a liter of whole blood out, then hemoglobin hematocrit value might be normal, so you really can't use it in the acutely bleeding trauma patient. I have a few cautions here, all right? So, remember, I talked about heart rate, pulse pressure, all of these different variables, but you gotta think there are patient populations where this is gonna be different. So in the elderly, perhaps you have somebody that's on medications like a beta blocker. They might not have an appropriate tachycardic response to hypovolemia. Think about a pregnant woman who has a fetus and might be late term and now has a very increased blood volume. They're gonna have a different set of vital signs. Children are gonna have a different set of vital signs and a different response to trauma. And I talked about their blood volume as 80 mils per kilo. And we also talked about thresholds for tachycardia. So over 160 in the infant, over 140 in the toddler, 120 in the preschooler, and over uh, 100 in an adult. Also the time from injury is gonna have an effect and the type of injury is gonna have effect. Some people will come in with isolated trauma, so for instance, a stab wound to the abdomen. Some people will come in with multi-system and multi-organ injury, perhaps that pedestrian versus auto accident. So that's it for this video. We talked about diagnosis and recognition, as well as the physiology of shock in the trauma patient. If you like this video, give it a like, give it a share, leave some comments. I love engaging with you. Next video, we're gonna have part two and that is the management and treatment of shock. We're gonna go through the ATLS algorithm.
I'm excited about it. I think you're going to learn a lot. Give me a shout out if you want me to do any other videos, but we're going to start doing a whole series now on shocks. So we've already done a few videos on trauma. We have that initial resuscitation video. All right, we want to watch that. We also have the airway video. That's an important one. Now we're going through shock. And after this, we're going to start getting in different compartments of the, of the body. So thoracic trauma, abdominal trauma, it's going to be exciting. All right. So stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.